Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at exam style questions for the potometer practical. Hi guys, welcome back to our potometer videos. So we've been through the planning and the implementation videos of the experiment and now we need to tackle a few exam questions that refer to both of these stages, just to give you a flavour of what you might sort of see in the exam. So we've got a question here about rates of transpiration. So we've got a student is studying the effects of various light intensities upon rates of transpiration on the plant pelargonium. She wishes to use a potometer and use measurements of water uptake to estimate the rates of transpiration across five UV lamp intensities. So they always give you this kind of background to the experiment. So we've got rates of transpiration and we're using the potometer that we've been discussing where it's measuring the uptake of water and it's talking about how light intensities affect these rates and she's got five different intensities. So part A says describe a method she can use to collect her data and it's about six marks. So we're going to have to give quite an in-depth method. But again, with all of these types of method questions, if you think about from square one, setting up, gathering equipment, putting it all together, and then how you record, it makes it a lot easier to tackle the question starting from the beginning to the end. So I'll show you what I've written here. I sometimes number them. Sometimes you can write a sort of one to six bullet point system if you want to, or you can just do bullet points like I've done here. Whatever's easier for you. Some people prefer to write in just a continuous paragraph. Some people might argue that a bullet point or a number layout makes it easier for the examiner to go, yep, yeah, that's one step, that's two, and then eventually count six marks. But I didn't used to do that in my exams, and sometimes it was completely fine. In fact, most of the time it was completely fine. So anything that works for you. So the first part I've put is to cut the leafy shoots from the plant and then remove the ends under water. So that's one of the first things that you need to do is you need to get your plant, get the leafy shoots from the plant and cut the ends under water because without that, even with a potometer set up, you can't really measure anything. So that's one mark. I then said to lower the potometer into the sink full of water to fill it and lose any air bubbles. So this is what you do before you set any of the tubes and attach them to the plant because if you have any air bubbles left inside it will just block up the xylem tissue and you won't be able to measure the transpiration. I then put place the shoot into the tube with a bung for a tight seal. So again that's just a point about setting the whole thing up together and making sure we've got a nice tight seal so that the water can flow freely from wherever our bubble is into the plant. I then put that we lift the potometer out of the sink and with the plant and we let the air bubble form at the free end. So that's another mark. We let an air bubble form. Without the air bubble, we can't measure anything. And then we stop the bubble by placing the free end in a beaker of water. Again, it doesn't matter if it's a beaker of water. It's just the idea that you've got the principle right of the fact that we need one clearly defined bubble, if possible, and that we want to place the free end in water so that we don't get continuous bubbles forming or water just leaking out. So then I put, allow the bubble to round the corner and then let the plant settle and dry. Again, you don't have to discuss every point about why you do it, that's more of an implementation thing, but you could go on to say that the reason we dry the leaves is because if they're wet, the rate of transpiration is going to decrease. And then for each UV light intensity, because now I need to refer it back to her particular experiment, measure the distance moved by the bubble for an allocated time. So although the general method is the same as the potometer video that we made or that we talked about in the previous videos, you have to relate this to the actual experiment which is going on in the question. And this student wishes to test the effects of the five UV lamp intensities. Now you're only talking about describing a method to collect the data, you don't need to go on about how she needs to work out the volume of a cylinder and all of that stuff, but you just need to say that she needs to measure the distance the bubble moves for each of the intensities for a given time so that later she can compare them. So overall I've sort of highlighted several different points here and you probably would pick up more than six marks if you wrote all of this, but it's just giving you a flavour of the kind of marks that you should be aiming for. So that's part A. Part B says once the apparatus is set up, she begins the timing immediately. Why is it important to wait for some time before starting the, the timer? So this is two marks. So there's a little bit of an explanation here. Why do we have to wait for some time before the timer starts? And we've already kind of briefly touched upon why we do this. So I've written an answer here that says, if the leaves are wet, this may block the pores or the stomata, because the stomata are very small. They're only about a cell or two thick. This means that transpiration cannot occur, so the leaves need time to dry. So it's a very simple experiment. If we took the plant and the potometer straight out of the sink and began timing with the bubble, the leaves still haven't dried. So if they're wet, no transpiration is going to occur, which means the water won't be uptaken as much and the bubble basically won't move very much at all. So it's very important that you let this happen. And another reason is that we just need the plant to adjust. It's just been cut from its plant, cut again underwater, and then put into a strange piece of apparatus. So it's very important to just allow the whole thing to dry, the whole thing to sort of equilibrate to whatever's happening at the moment. So part C says, we've got two parts of the question here. The UV lamp is placed just a few centimetres away from the leaves of the shoots. The lamps give off different levels of heat depending on the intensity chosen. 
How does this complicate the experiment? And name two other conditions which need to be controlled. So this is kind of relating to the different factors that affect transpiration that we've talked about in the other videos. The different intensities expose the leaves to different temperatures, which is another factor that affects transpiration. She will not be able to tell if the differences in the transpiration rate are due to light intensity or the temperature. So remember, she's trying to test how light intensity affects the transpiration rate, which means that she'll need to control all the other factors, humidity, temperature, and everything else. But if these lamps are giving off different levels of heat, then she's unable to control temperature. So even if she saw a trend in her results, she won't be able to tell if that trend is due to the light intensity that she's trying to look at, or if it's due to the temperature that which she can't control. So that's how it complicates the experiment. The next part says, name two other conditions which need to be controlled. This is basically two other factors that affect transpiration that we must try and keep the same, no matter how difficult it is in the lab or not. And one of those is humidity of the surroundings, which is one mark, and I put wind levels or air circulation, which is another mark. Part D says, five shoots from the pelargonium were used, each with a different light intensity. After 20 minutes, the distance the air bubble moved was recorded, and the student's results were as follows. So always look at the table you've been given and analyse it properly to see what you can already spot before they ask you anything about it. So we've got light intensity on the left, so that's the independent variable, and we've ranked one to five, with five being the most intense. So as we go down, these are higher light intensities. We've then got the distance moved after 20 minutes in millimetres, so it looks like we can already see the trend that as we go down the light intensities, as it gets more intense, it seems to have moved more, which is kind of what we'd expect. And then we've got on the right here the volume of the cylinder moved. So this is basically taking the distance and turning it into a volume using the tube's radius. So the next part says, logically, the capillary tube has a radius of one millimetre. Calculate the volume of the cylinder moved for the four and five light intensity experiments. So we've got to basically fill in the rest of the table. So. I'll show you how to do this calculation here. So first of all, you need to remember that the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times h. Remember with r being the radius of the cylinder and h being the length or the height of the cylinder itself. So for number four, or for light intensity number four, we've got pi, which is the same as always. I'm going to use it as 3.14. They would usually say to either use it as that, or you can just use it as pi on your calculator. The radius is one millimeter, so that's one squared, which is just going to be one. And then the height of the cylinder is basically the distance that it moved. So for number four, it moves 17 millimeters. And if we do 17 times one times pi, we get 53.38 millimeters cubed. And I've left it to two decimal places because that's how the other three in the table were presented. And it makes sense just to keep it exactly the same as the way they've done it. For number five, we do exactly the same thing. We do pi times one squared times 21 millimetres this time. And that gives us 65.94 millimetres cubed. So as long as you remember the formulas for the volume of a cylinder, you should be fine. So the next part after that says, calculate the rate of water uptake for the four and five light intensity experiments in millimetres cubed per minute. So this logically follows on from having found the volume. So if you remember from our analysis video, Finding the rate is basically dividing the volume by the time. So the volume, let's start with light intensity number four. The volume turned out to be 53.38 millimeters cubed. And the time taken for that was 20 minutes because that's how long she left each one for. So the rate therefore would be 53.38 divided by 20, which turns out to be 2.67 millimeters cubed per minute. And I've left that to two decimal places because that's what we've been leaving everything else as. You do exactly the same for number five. The volume was 65.94 millimeters cubed. The time again is 20 minutes. So the rate is therefore 65.94 divided by 20, which turned out to be 3.30 millimeters cubed per minute. So it's actually higher than the number fours, which is what we'd expect. So moving on to F then. So part F says, the student concludes that as light intensity increases, the rate of transpiration increases. Explain why this trend is likely to be accurate. So this is basically more of a scientific question. Why is it likely that as light intensity increases, the rate of transpiration increases? And this goes back to our video in analysis that we talked about before. So here's the answer that I've written here. I've put that as light intensity increases, which you could put as sunlight, the rate of photosynthesis increases, so that's one mark. 
because UV light catalyzes the reaction. So the more light there is, the more photosynthesis the plant is going to do because it's more possible. The demand for CO2 rises and the O2 levels rise, so the stomata open more frequently. So that's what happens in the day. The stomata on the leaves open more frequently to allow more gas exchange, so that's the second mark. And as a result of this, the water evaporates more through the stomata, so the transpiration rate does increase. So you've got three things going on here. If the light intensity is high, the rate of photosynthesis goes up. If you're having more photosynthesis occurring, your demand for gas exchange goes higher, so the stomata begin to open. And because they're opening more often, the transpiration of water through them is going to go up as well. So it's all just a bit of a logical story, really. It's all about how you write that nice and concisely so the examiner can think, right, he's got the three major points down here. I'll give him the three marks. So just think of it as a scientific, logical explanation. Part G, after that, then says, identify two limitations with the photometer. So it's always good for every experiment you do in this course to just think about what are the problems, what are some of the limitations, and you don't have to learn, I mean, it's a good idea to learn as many as you can off by heart, but as long as you can think laterally and think, what is this lacking? What can we not get from the, this experiment? This can really help you to come to some answers for this. So here I've written two examples. I've put, it is only an estimate of transpiration rate. The rate of water uptake does not equal the rate of transpiration because some water is stored or used for photosynthesis. So some of the water that's uptaken from the protometer actually goes into the xylem, gets stored in the xylem, goes to different organs like the fruit of the plant or goes to the roots. And then a lot of it is lost in transpiration, but therefore it's not the entirety that gets uptaken. It's just a portion of this. It's a very high portion, so it's actually a very close estimate, but it's still a limitation. This isn't an exact measurement. So that's one limitation that I always try to remember. The other limitation that I've chosen is that it's a very complex setup, many different parts, and leaks are common and it's very hard to control them. And it's also very hard to detect the leaks as well. So it's very hard to see these unless you do some replicates where they might crop up as anomalous results. So just acknowledging that it's a very complicated piece of apparatus where it's, it's very easy to get leaks which are hard to detect. That's a very important limitation that it's a good one to remember as well. There are several other limitations you could talk about, but I've just chosen two there, probably the most common ones that people would actually mention in the exam. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.